Hi, thank you for clicking on this video. Today, we'll be talking about the MOBA Awards or music of black origin. The reason I wanted to talk about it today is because the MOBAs have kind of had a little bit of an up and down lifetime, but I also kind of want to just analyze them generally, especially seeing as there's been some recent discussions online about it. And this is, I think the second year since their two year long hiatus. I'm, I'm recording this video before this year's MOBA Awards have taken place but I'm gonna release this video probably a little bit after they've taken place, I'm still deciding. So let's see how it goes. I still don't quite know what this year's MOBA awards are gonna be like, but prior to this point, life has been a bit tumultuous for the MOBOs, let's just say. The MOBOs stands for Music of Black Origin, and it was founded by somebody called Kanye King in 1996 making it the first black award show in Europe. Kanye King began her career after a teenage pregnancy prompted her to drop out of sixth form college and divert her attention to the entertainment industry. It was during these early years working for Clark Television Studios that she spotted gaps in showcasing black artists. And so she started hosting underground events in Wilsden, which is in Northwest London. Spurred on by a conversation about London's changing demographics, Kanye pitched the idea of an award show and within weeks, the first MOBA awards took place. The first winners were House Group, Baby D, who received an award for Best Dance Act, and Goldie, who got Best Jungle Act and Best Album. However, within a few short years, there was already controversy in 2003 seeing Justin Timberlake and Christina Aguilera, two white Americans, win the top awards and Tim Westfoot, and Tim Westfoot, you know, and Tim Westwood win Best DJ for the second time in three years of being nominated. Calls for a boycott followed, and although electronic music had been part of the MOBO's beginnings, by 2004, the electronic categories had disappeared. So, while right-wingers might look on and think, why isn't there all MOBOs? The MOBOs have had some issues with excluding black people over the years. The definition it uses, music of black origin, may actually be part of the problem, strangely enough. You kind of have to sit and ask, how is this being interpreted? For example, English speaking pop music, especially here and in the States over the last, I don't know, like eight decades or so, <laughs> ultimately derives from black music. So where do you draw the line? Take Jessie J, for example, who is very much decidedly a pop artist. In 2011, she took away four awards that year, including best album. Now, there's no getting away from the fact that someone who makes runs like this is inspired by black music. And in fact, she said herself that Whitney Houston is one of her biggest influences. To contrast, you have Labyrinth, who is black. And in a 2012 interview, he said that, quote, I think the MOBO ceremony is weird because Ed Sheeran doesn't make black music. He makes commercial pop. Even I'm not making black music. It's commercial music, but it is more related to hip hop. So it makes more sense. With the likes of Jessie J, Adele, and Christina Aguilera receiving awards over the years despite being unquestionably pop, this might mean that all derivative music would be eligible for recognition. This, however, is not always the case when you think of the likes of Skunk and Nancy, one of Britain's biggest rock bands in the 1990s, who, among influences such as punk and metal, also named Scar as an inspiration through the impact it had on lead singer Skin's sound, having been raised in the Jamaican household. That was a hard sentence. In fact, the band had been routinely left out of the black music narrative with one recent example being when Skin had to go on record in a 2019 article correcting Beyonce and Stormzy for their separate claims of being the first black artist to perform at Glastonbury when in fact she was the first in 1999. Or how about Seal, another hugely successful black British artist of the 1990s who is probably as pop as Lambrimp is and yet has never received a MOBO nomination despite soulful influences. So maybe it isn't a case of black origin or even commercial music of black origin. Perhaps it's more accurately a case of commercial music of black origin that can also be labeled as urban. So what is urban anyway? Like, where does that term come from? Well, the term urban contemporary was invented by New York radio DJ Frankie Hollywood Crocker. Since at least the 1920s, 
American radio has featured black music shows and recognizing audiences of all backgrounds listen to this type of music, Crocker came up with Urban Contemporary. Urban technically covers anything that is popular on the street and at its core includes the likes of rap, hip hop, R&B, jazz, gospel and club. In recent years, Urban has become an increasingly controversial topic as it's used as a catch-all term for music created by any black artist regardless of the actual genre. For example, in 2020, Lizzo won the Grammy for Best Urban Contemporary Album despite being a decidedly pop artist. After years and years of criticism from black artists, the Grammys finally announced that they would be retiring the category, replacing it with Best Progressive R&B Album. In the UK, the opposite yet related problem seems to be true. The history of homegrown black music dates back to the post-war era, and the 70s and 80s saw a boom in recording studios and record shops opening in areas with large black populations. Eventually, the commercial successes of Soul to Soul and Massive Attack were the catalyst for international attention on black British music, and more artists followed in their wake. It was also during this time that there was a shift towards becoming more watered down, as labels expected British artists to change in order to have more quote-unquote mass appeal. This watering down was also happening to an extent in America and created an industry of manufactured, highly reproducible, winning formulas that could be applied to any performer regardless of skin colour or even initial connection to the genre. In 2020, a collective of senior black British music execs from the likes of Warner, Universal Music Group and Spotify to name a few, formed the Black Music Coalition and wrote an open letter to the industry calling for an end to racism in the sector. One of its members, Shah Grant, a senior A&R exec at BMG said that the term urban is outdated as for years the British charts have been dominated by black talent both from here and around the world. Whitney Boateng from Metropolis Music said quote, urban music strips away the blackness from the music. Black is not a swear word. It does not mean that people who are not black are not included. It just means that you're giving credit to its makers and forefathers. The issue in the UK it seems then is that while there is no problem identifying music with black roots, there is a problem giving proper credit when the artist is a black person. So I've introduced some of the issues surrounding the Mobos and it's been kind of an issue for most of its lifetime. It's been like this for almost 20 years and it was founded in 1996. However, I also do want to pivot for a second and have a look at some of the surrounding issues of black British music and not just zero in on the Mobos. For example, we're well aware of the problem with black actors almost always having to leave the UK in order to get their big break and it's normally in the States, but what if I told you that this was also true up until very recently for black British musicians? Take Sade, who have found huge success in America from the 1980s onwards, but only received a lukewarm reception here. Smooth Operator debuted at number 5 on America's Billboard Hot 100, but only made it to number 19 in the UK charts. Or how about Estelle, who moved to the States? citing at the time how difficult it was for British R&B artists to be taken seriously at home. Estelle is probably best known for her 2008 duet with Kanye West on American Boy and is now the voice actor for Garnet on Steven Universe. While things have improved in recent years, it hasn't gone away entirely, with Ella May's five-time platinum 2018 hit booed up making it to number one in the US R&B charts but only number 52 over here. If we look at rap, Tiny Temper, who was decently successful over here, still moved to the States where he became the first UK rapper to get a platinum single in the 2010 track Written in the Stars. I could keep going, but generally it's been pretty rough for UK artists. And I hand on heart believe that these last eight or nine years or so have been a golden age in black British music, but not everyone is getting their credit. As far as the Mobos has been in what I just mentioned specifically, They've been pretty consistent in their support for everyone, with three of the four people I mentioned either being nominated or winning. Throughout the years, the Mobos has been supportive of genres like hip hop, R&B, gospel, reggae and grime, but there is one entire class of UK music that gets completely missed off, no accolades, no nothing, which is dance and electronic music. As I said in the beginning, Electronic and dance music has been a part of the Mobos from its beginning, but in 2004, the category was removed and hasn't been reinstated. There are incorrect stereotypes about dance and electronic music being associated exclusively with white people, which can put black people off, and crucially, it undercuts and pushes out black artists in the scene. There is a lack of understanding of the integral part that dance music has played in black history in the UK and vice versa. For example, Jungle came about during the late 80s and early 90s as the children of the Windrush generation were growing up and emerging from a combination of influences, 
soul, reggae, rare groove and jazz, as well as hardcore and breakbeats. It was originally pretty underground and people like Mark Mack had to keep a low profile during his career dealing with racial stereotyping in the nightclub scene. If you want to know more about that, I've made a video on that topic, please check it out. While it was always a multicultural scene and a multicultural sound, it was increasingly grabbing the attention of mainstream media, which eventually exerted an influence from the outside. For example, it gradually going from being referred to as jungle to drum and bass. Perceptions of it also varied within the black community and it seemed like a lot of people just struggled to get it at first because of its associations with white people, until they heard it mixed with reggae or funk beats and it would connect with them in the way it was intended. Eventually, its black, working class roots had been erased in mainstream media. Another feature of erasure has been the invisibility of the black female vocalists. Their vocals are some of the most recognisable on some of the biggest hits and yet most people would not be able to put a face to a voice. Singers are often not included in the song credits and they certainly don't get paid in line with how well the song does or how much money it makes for its DJ. So, can we say that the Mobos was falling in line with this erasure then, rather than leading with its vantage point of being able to see a broad overview of all the different types of music that black people in the UK produce. There is something poignant about the fact that the Mobos could very well be used as a tool to raise the profile of black artists in the electronic space, but it seems unable to do so and it hasn't really ever expanded on why. There's also a lot to be said about the broadness of some categories like Best African Music Act and the omission of rock and alternative music. The reason people care about all of this is because the Mobos are significant. People have always wanted the Mobos to succeed. The Brit Awards, established in 1977, have been notorious in how inconsistent it can be in showing recognition to black artists, especially homegrown ones. There have been a few occasions where the only black person to win anything has been from the States, like the three-year run that Kanye West had back in the late 2000s. The welcome edition of GRM's Rated Awards in 2015, which celebrates grime and UK rap to name a few, adds to the legacy created by the Mobos, and with the high black British music have been on in the last few years, the Mobos should go up there and join them. <sighs> okay, so, different day, different month even, uh, from the main bit that I just recorded. That was done before this year's MOBOs, and this is a couple of days after this year's MOBOs, which were on the 5th of December, 2021. So I thought I would add some of my thoughts now that I've actually, like, seen it. First things first, I will start with what I liked or what I thought was positive about it. First one, I've got notes. I'm so glad that it's back. It's back properly because last year's one was virtual because of COVID and 2019's was canceled completely. So I'm glad that this one, this year's one was a proper, traditional, good old fashioned, lavish ceremony. Rather than it being virtual, rather than it being some other kind of arrangement, I'm glad that it was just a straightforward award show. Another thing that I really liked were the, the hosts separately. I really think Munya Chihuahua is hilarious. I've watched his videos. I think he's great. I love what he's doing. I love seeing him on TV as well. I'm glad that he's getting mainstream recognition as well. He kept a lot of us sane during the pandemic with his skit. So it was good to see him presenting something like the Mobos. I really enjoyed Leanne Pinnock. I think she comes across as a really sweet person. She's stunning. I can't believe that she's snapped back the way she has. And I know that there's a lot of pressure on people to act like they weren't pregnant. And this girl was pregnant with Kenda and Taiwo. It wasn't even just one single baby. She had two babies. So good for her. And then I also really enjoy Eddie Caddy. I really, really enjoy him. And actually it's funny because I've just come in from Mo Gilligan's uh, Black British Takeover in the O2. And Eddie Caddy was hosting. The thing about funk is, we did not know what we was doing. <laughs> you had plans to go to the toilet, then you met your bridge, halfway you could I'll go to the toilet. Bro, Dave, what are you saying, my friend? You're right. Then you spotted your ex, you're like, what are you doing here? Now you don't know, should I go to the toilet? See my ex, spot my guy. I'm confused. <laughs> you could kind of tell that he is a seasoned host watching the Mobos. He has a background in things like Sunday Show and Coco Bar and Africa versus Jamaica and Bad Boys of Comedy and all those nights in the Apollo or the Empire, if anyone knows. So yeah, I, I was I was glad to see him hosting as well at the Mobos. He he is a legend in that sense. So I liked 
that Young Philly and Chunks got their flowers that night. I think they're two really good guys, really good content creators. I'm glad that they shouted out Harry Pinero as well. I just, yeah, I like their energy. I think everyone does, you know? I also like seeing DJ Brantry. So for those of you who don't know, he had a stroke in 2017. So he is nowhere near as active as he used to be. So seeing him being there to present somebody with their award was in my opinion, really special. And that, that's something that I really like about the Mobos actually is that they, they know how to take somebody and give them their recognition sometimes obviously you know the bulk of my video was talking about the things that they've been missing but i'm talking about the things that they've actually been doing like sometimes there are people who would never get any kind of mainstream recognition and the mobo seems to be quite mindful of that and and make sure that they will give them their moment so i was it was nice to see him uh similar about frank bruno so i don't know what my audience is like but i think for those of you who are quite young, you might not be familiar with Frank Bruno. Frank Bruno is a boxer. He's a British boxer, but he became more famous for his mental health crises. And he was, in my opinion, the poster child for a lot of what white Britain is afraid of because he was this big black boxer and he was having all of these mental health crises and he was intimidating. And he was also kind of like a joke for the media, uh, uh, you know, many a moon ago. So the fact that he's been kind of out of the public eye, he's had debilitating issues with mental health and he's become an advocate and ambassador for that. And that was what he was getting recognition for. It was like a, uh, I don't know if it was a lifetime achievement award, but it was definitely a moment where you saw his work and he actually got to speak. So that was really nice. And Kanye King introduced him as well. So I think that that special and very specific moment for him was, very appropriate i really liked it and you could tell it meant a lot to him as well what else what, what have i written down my goodness i have no idea what i wrote <laughs> so we're just gonna okay live performances all of the live performances in my opinion were really great and actually one of them introduced me to someone i hadn't come across before called potter paper he's great but i loved all of the live performances i think i unfortunately need to move on to the negatives right and the negative might actually sound somewhat contradictory because the point I'm gonna make at the end almost makes it seem like, well, I'm part of the problem, but bear with me. I'll start with the chemistry between the hosts was a little bit off. Like I didn't really, I think they kept missing each other's jokes. They kept talking over each other. I actually felt like Eddie Caddy and Mo Gilligan had more chemistry as two comedians when Eddie Caddy was interviewing Mo Gilligan one time, you know, in between awards. I don't know, you know, they just have those little in-between bits where they're chatting. They had fantastic chemistry. And again, Eddie Caddy was at his show days later today. I don't know why that was. I don't know, I don't know how award shows work. I don't know if people have rehearsals or whether it's just a thing where you know your place and you just wing it on the day. I have no idea, but I, there were times when you could see that Munya was calculating in his mind. It was, you could see things ticking, ticking, ticking in his brain where he could see the time was running out. At one point he was trying to rush Eddie and Eddie was really determined to get this joke out, you know, and it was like, babes, I don't, I, it was a lot. It was a little bit chaotic. And there were times when Leanne was trying to speak and they were kind of just talking over her or not really hearing her. So it was, it was minor, it could have been worse. Another thing is the crowd, the audience, they weren't great. Now I don't know whether it's fair to say that because it could have just as easily have been the audio because bearing in mind, we at home are watching it on YouTube. So we're not live, we're not sat there in the crowd. For all I know, the crowd could have been fantastic so maybe what I've said is unfair, but if it's not unfair, then the crowd were very unreceptive. It was, it was kind of awkward at times. And at one point I wasn't even sure they were booing somebody. It was just, I don't know. I don't know what was going on for the crowd. The other thing is actually speaking about the crowd and just the overall setting. It reminded me, cause I've been kind of on and off with the MOBOs over the last like 20 years. And one thing that I remember about it is there's this weird, kind of slightly budget edge to it which is strange because it's definitely lavish and 
definitely a production. It's not like their budget is low. It's not like they're struggling. So I think it's more of an organization thing than a budget thing. But when I describe it as budget, it, there is just something about it that feels a little bit makeshift at times. At one point you had somebody waving a piece of paper at Munia and, and Eddie, and she was there for ages and it was kind of awkward. As I said, there were issues with the audio sometimes. It just, I, I don't know, there was just a vibe to it. And the crowd, I think, so people were, <laughs> if you were watching the live stream and reading the comments, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why I go on for these people. But they were pointing out, where did you find these people in the audience? Did you find them on the streets of Coventry? And I was busting up. There was an air of mild disorganization. That's probably the better way to put it. Maybe not budget, but you know, a lot of the winners didn't come and they didn't even send in a video or somebody to go and accept the award on their behalf. And I don't know whether that's disrespectful. I don't know whether it's an organizational thing. I have no idea, but this is a persistent issue with the MOBOs. Like I was reminded of it the second I started noticing it. I was like, oh yeah, this is a thing. What's that about? What I was saying earlier about me having criticism about the MOBOs and how I might come across as a little bit contradictory, because at the end of the day, I like the MOBOs. I really like the idea of them. I think everybody does. People who win MOBOs feel very honored it's a big deal if you're a black person in the UK who gets recognized with a MOBO for something that you've done. So I don't necessarily think people consciously don't rate the MOBOs, but between the comments, the comments were clowning. Don't get me wrong, black British social media in general can't take anything seriously, yeah? But at the same time, I think a lot of the people in the comments were touching on something that has always been a thing. Because even when I was at school, we used to say, like when I was a young person, we used to say kind of the same thing of, oh, this is bait, blah, 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 blah. And we still watched it. We, this, is, this is what I'm saying. Like everybody actually does still watch it. But I don't know whether it's an us thing of never being happy and always complaining about stuff or whether it's a them thing of actually they give us things to complain about. They give us things to not rate. I'm not sure. I can't really tell. All I know is it just reminded me of an issue that the MOBOs has always had of people just not coming and people not fully, fully, fully rating it. I don't know, maybe I'll make a video about that because I think that's part of a broader issue. And it's also why I really emphasize the fact that black British music has gone through a heyday the last eight, nine years. It has never had as much recognition as it is getting now, never. So I think it's part of a broader issue with just how we view our stuff in general in this country. My final point, which is a little bit minor is they rushed through quite a few key categories, key awards at the end. And I'm really not sure why. I'm not sure if they were on a time crunch. I'm not sure if the venue in Coventry was like, listen, if you go over by even a minute, we will charge you 10 grand per second that you go over. I don't know, but they rushed through those categories and then was like, all right, see you later, get out. Also, I've already mentioned the broadness of some of the categories, best reggae act and you have a dancehall artist win because I guess that's the only category dancehall can win anything. I already mentioned best African artist, same problem. But it's, I would say it's not necessarily a minor. I actually think it's quite significant, but I don't necessarily think that it's a reason to cuss the mobos and boycott it. I just think it's something that they need to be mindful of. But other than that, like I said, I'm glad it's back properly. I'm glad that it happened before these new COVID restrictions were announced. There's probably going to be more to come at some point. Country's in chaos. Before I go into any detail about that, it is late. I am tired. I can't think straight. I need to go to bed. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, please click the like button and please check out my other videos, especially the demonization of nightlife because it's connected to this. But all the others too, that would be good. You might end up subscribing.